I've just been looking up the uh, price of this lens on Shop Olympus and the UK price is £549. I see they've recently knocked £50 off the price but it's much less than many of the pro lenses. And what I want to show you now is simply how good this lens is for anybody out there working on a tight budget. Furthermore, I'm not going to use the lens on my posh camera, that is the EM1. I'm going to use it on the EM10 Mark II. So let's have a look at the pictures, shall we, and see what you think. I've got 10 to show to you. The first photograph on the screen is fairly straightforward in a technical sense. It shows Batemans, the former home of Rudyard Kipling, now in the care of the National Trust. If you drive down the A21 out of London towards Hastings and about halfway down, you'll find the brown signs directing you to the property. In terms of the dynamic range, it's pretty straightforward. Dare I say you could take a decent picture of this with a smartphone. I am mentioning dynamic range now because what we must bear in mind that irrespective of camera make, or cost. As yet, we have not produced a camera as good as the human eye and the way the brain interprets the information. You are better than anything we can make in that this category. And when we come to the next picture, we will see this problem more clearly. But in regard to this picture, it's pretty straightforward. It's almost point and shoot. But I still think it's a nice picture. Here immediately we see an example of what I mean. Shooting into the light, the light intense on the water, whereas the bank beyond is not, in, is not sunlit. And so you've got this huge dynamic range that the camera cannot handle without a bit of help from us. I'm going to ignore HDR. There might be a problem there because, of course, the water is moving. I'm going to use traditional photographic techniques. And what I've done is to spot meter the water to get the exposure of that correct. Don't use matrix. There's too much shadow in the background that will fool it. Spot meter the highlight. Yes, of course, the background now is going to be underexposed. But if you save to RAW, then you've got the option of increasing the exposure just a little bit in the dark areas. I had a look at that and I felt that lightening the background removed the drama from the picture. So I left it as it was taken, more or less. I'm not a photographic fraud. Why do I say that? That rainbow is for real. Of course, we might put in a rainbow in the name of art. But then with a lovely landscape like this, who are you trying to fool? If you understand weather patterns related to landscapes, then you will find out, as I did, that this part of Scotland seems to attract a lot of showery weather that creates rainbows like this. I've been here a couple of times with other photographers on my photographic holidays and we've seen this situation more than once. Before we move on, I just want to demonstrate to you the difference between extreme wide angle at 14 millimeters and now we move to telephoto, that is 150, to give you some idea of the range of this particular lens.
From the big view, we go to something a little closer. I haven't looked up the specification of this lens. I'm not sure how close you can get to the subject. But whatever it is, this picture is absolutely sharp. And furthermore, I haven't helped myself by going towards the telephoto end of the lens that will reduce depth of field, as will the wide aperture. All I can say in its defence, and my carelessness, shall we say, that micro four thirds gives you more depth of field than larger formats. And here you can see quite clearly a plus point regarding that. The 14 to 150 zoom lens does not have its own image stabilizer. You'll probably have to pay a bit more if you wanted something like that, but the camera does. And of course, I've used it in this shot at the church at Glenfinnan. Because of the low level of light, then the shutter speed was a 20th of a second. And I think the picture, handheld of course, is absolutely sharp. Regarding the variation in light sources, I will have saved to RAW, therefore I can adjust white balance, not on site, but in the comfort of my own home, where I shall have more time. And I think I've got it uh, from memory uh, just about right. The Torrent Walk is just outside Dolgethly in Wales, right in the southern part of Snowdonia, not far from Cader Idris. Now with this shot, it might not be apparent like that high dynamic range shot I showed you earlier of Loch Leven, that spot metering is essential. The water here needs less exposure than the surrounding bank. And if you don't swap meter, then your water is going to burn out. You will not see all the tiny patterns in the water if this shot is overexposed. You must spot meter, save to raw, and then lighten the bank a bit in post-production. I see other pictures of waterfalls where the water is burnt out. That is simply not right. Another water shot, but of course quite different to the last one. This time I've blurred the water, creating a sense of movement by using a fairly long shutter speed, an eighth of a second, and yes, before you ask, it is handheld, relying on the superb image stabilization in the EM10 Mark II camera. Also, as you might gather by now, I have spot metered the water so it doesn't burn out. You've got all that delicate tone still in the water, and if the bank goes a little dark, then by saving it to RAW, I can adjust that in post-production in products like uh, Adobe Lightroom or Photoshop. Another water shot, this time in Wales. Last one, incidentally, was in Scotland and handheld once more at an eighth of a second. And I think it's absolutely sharp. I'm often asked, what do I photograph when it's raining? Here's the answer for you. And if you look very carefully at the shot, you might spot a speck of water on the lens as well. Well, it adds atmosphere, doesn't it? When I ran photographic holidays for HF holidays, from their hotel based, we were based at North Balahulish. In the planning, I prided myself 
in turning up at the right place at the right time. That is, in respect of the direction of light. Uh, I had to rely, of course, on a certain amount of luck regarding the weather. But I think I've got it right here. There was, as you might imagine, particularly looking at the highlight beyond the monument, there was a huge dynamic range. And of course, I had to spot meter for that highlight. And I did have to do quite a lot of post-production afterwards in Lightroom. Took a little bit of time, but uh, I think I've got there. For the final shot, we go to Castle Stalker, which you might recognise. I think I'm right in saying that it was featured in one of the Monty Python films. This shot, not perhaps the usual one, most people go to the cafe up on the hill and look down on the castle. This is a little different. It's on a by-road to Port Appin, and there is a lay-by there where you can pull over, and this is the view that you can enjoy. In terms of lighting, which of course I'm not in control of, but I was fortunate in that the mountain beyond the castle was sunlit, whereas the castle itself was still in shadow, adding a suitable touch of atmosphere to these rather austere places. Well, that's the end of this selection. Hope you've enjoyed them and make your own judgment as to how good you think they are. Now, whilst I might do most of my work with the EM1 and the 12 to 100 Pro lens, which I think is a fantastic optic, and I've done many YouTube programs about it, but dare I say, there are times when you are in your late 70s that you find the kit a little bit too heavy. You may have noticed that most of the selection, I think all bar one, were done in either Wales or Scotland. And quite frankly, when you're going on a long trip like that, you want to travel light because there are other things you have to take, not camera gear, but important things like your lunch, for example, and maybe warm clothing. And this, of course, is where the EM10 and that lens, the 14 to 150, really comes into its own. And on those grounds alone, it's worth serious consideration.